Keep us from harm. Teach us to be true to each other, ourselves, and thee. Lord, we ask that you guide and direct us as we do on business of the Coffee County School System here this afternoon in the best interest of our boys and girls and all of our teachers and staff here in Coffee County. Lord, just help us do good work and guide and direct us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Uh, everybody got a copy of the agenda? Any changes? Anything else? I move we adopt the agenda as presented. <laughs> yes, sir. I'm going to update the board. Uh, I spoke with the board members about the retreat we had back in February. I know uh, there have been some conversations about maybe updating the board on projects that we've been working through and, and presenting the projects in a public meeting and just updating the board on where we're at with some of those projects. So I wanted to just work through this short slideshow and discuss uh, some of the things we've been doing. A lot to celebrate at Coffee High School. Coffee High School has had renovations. We renovated the lighting. We have all new lighting, LED lighting, painting throughout the building ceiling tiles throughout the building, new HVAC throughout the building. So the high school looks like a new school on the inside. It looks, turned out really well. Those are some pictures of, that's the media center there. You notice the, the paint on the walls. It really gives it a, a, a much brighter feeling with the new lights and the new paint inside the high school. That's the media center on the left. The Performing Arts Center, we've taken uh, control of the Performing Arts Center. The contractor has turned it over to us, and the Performing Arts Center is complete. Now, we've talked about having a ribbon cutting in January and uh, coming back in January and officially doing a ribbon cutting, but it is our facility at this point. Uh, the boys and girls out at the high school and the teachers are using the Performing Arts Center every day. It's getting a lot of use right now uh, so i've seen the drama classes in there and the band classes in there we're also having classes in there in the lobby on the right you'll see the pictures of the lobby and you see those desks we're having some classes in there so that the students can socially distance and be six feet apart uh, they've moved some classes to the uh, performing arts center lobby as well as there's an area in the back of the Performing Arts Center that's somewhat like a classroom that they're using. There's also the Black Box Theater. But the lobby turned out beautiful, really beautiful facility. Uh, it's, it just came, turned out really nice. Eastside Elementary School this summer. Before you leave the Coffee yes, Heart campus, what is left to still do with the renovations at Coffee Heart? Michael? We're uh, doing the punch list now. There's paint touch up, some electrical problems, some data drops that needs to be repaired, and then uh, a few window replacements, some hollow metal frame replacement, and the plumbing. There's, there's some issues with uh, getting material to finish the plumbing. So do we expect to finish that while the kids are there? Are we going to do that like during Thanksgiving and Christmas when they're out? So it'll be done by year I'm, end? I'm hoping it's done by Thanksgiving. Oh, thank you. Okay. But I was asked this week I wanted to be able to provide it. It's really dependent. Some of it depends on when they can get the material in because of the COVID. Okay. Did Jim Poole have been in something? Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. The gym turned out really nice. It's they actually put a uh, LBT tile at the south end of the gym this week, a maroon tile. Oh, so it really good. Great. Thank you, Mr. Clark. East side, we painted the interior of East side. All of the interior was painted over the summer. 
that's pictures of east side of west green the interior of west green was painted throughout that main corridor for those of you who have visited west green before it was raw brick and uh it's it's got a real nice finish on it now with the paint the green and the gold and then uh, you'll notice on the right the glass enclosure there and the security glass at west green we we have that at all of our elementary schools at this point so all the elementary schools have been outfitted with the security glass so that when people come into the buildings they have to be buzzed in and such as that can't get back into the office area so and that turned out nice for the COVID now too so ambrose uh we installed some fans and some lights in an area there at uh and she's got her her grow station what does she call it outdoor classroom uh, learning station it's beautiful i didn't put pictures of it in there because i don't want to steal her thunder i'm sure in a school presentation she's going to present that to y'all so i didn't put pictures of her outdoor classroom area i want mary to present that to y'all but she did send a picture of this little child uh who uh, picked the, the peppers out of the garden they've got a garden where the students are growing vegetables and the child was going to take the vegetables home to her family uh, this weekend so i was i thought i can't resist putting that in the slideshow for y'all but just a sweet picture all right future projects uh this this gets into what we're going to be working on over the ne next 12 to 24 months probably more like 36 months this is probably two to three years out what we'll be working on uh fiber optic moved to george washington carver of course y'all have approved that and we included whatever other ancillary costs may be in that estimate uh, around ninety five thousand dollars after everything's said and done that renovations be, have to go on over at your place that is already started all right I've already built an office for me in the corner of the warehouse our storage area and my former office will be done with the new server room over thanksgiving so we'll be done with that in the next six eight weeks that's great and uh michael i want to give uh, a kind of uh, kudos to your department for doing a lot of work within the district to get this piece ready so we're doing some of that in-house but it'll cost us around ninety five thousand dollars and we've got the George Washington Carver restroom and kitchen improvements. The kitchen has not been improved probably in 40 years. So it's time to do an improvement in the kitchen there. And also the restrooms, we're gonna improve the, the restrooms at George Washington. And then Indian Creek Elementary and Ambrose, y'all approved the application for that at our last monthly meeting. Two million three hundred thousand dollars is the uh, architect's estimate you notice right underneath it I put Indian Creek and Ambrose Department of Education entitlement reimbursement will be reimbursed approximately 1.3 million dollars from the state for that work ROTC facility we, we talked about that that was on the ballot uh, for the last East Bloss East Point current East Bloss so sometime over the next 12 to 24 36 months we'll be working on that math resource adoption and that would really be in Ms. Miller's department but I've included it on here because we'll use SPLOS money to make the purchases for new math resources we're going to have to have those and whenever she presents that to y'all she'll go into all the reasons why but I needed to include that in this and then security cameras and technology uh, this is a, a good estimate Chan feels like it may even be a little high but that'll finish us out with the security cameras new security cameras throughout all the schools and then transportation purchases of course new buses over the next four years will be buying new buses each year and such as that so approximately two million dollars for that so just wanted to review are there any questions on any of that ask about um that rotc facility yes ma'am is that um is, is that the turf field that you were talking about is that in the rotc facility yes well we had some discussions about that but we kind of if you remember our retreat that we had we we primarily focusing on an rotc facility right now and that's pretty well the focus mm -hmm. so that would be something and they consist of 
uh, ROTC facility, multi-purpose room where they can do some marching and such as that, probably in there. Maybe have a, a BB gun range in there to be part of it. So it'd be ROTC facility, multi-purpose. So. Any other questions? Good question. All right. If there's no questions, that's a silly update. All right. School update. We've got Dr. Cummins here from Coffee High School. Welcome, Dr. Cummins. Thank you, Dr. Leeson. I thank the board for allowing me this opportunity to uh, come and talk about a lot of the good things we have going on at Coffee High School. Dr. Newell, do you have the PowerPoint? Or? Yes, sir. Okay. Again, I want to thank the board for uh, all the renovations and, and the foresight and vision that you used to, to help us get Coffee High School to one of the best campuses in our area and our region. Not only with the Performing Arts Center, but all the interior ex uh, renovations and modifications. I think we have a tremendous school. We have a beautiful, beautiful campus. And the maintenance and everything they do, keeping the grass cut. I tell you, I just, we just had a softball uh, playoff and the superintendent from Jones County was uh, commenting on how good the grounds look and how well all the facilities look to Coffee High School. And asked, he was asking me, how do we do that? I said, with a lot of hard work and a lot of commitment from everybody in our community that makes this happen. Now, I just wanted to start off my presentation with this picture. Some of you may have seen this picture because we've been here before as a country. I read in a book that says there's nothing new under the sun. This is in 1918. This is a Georgia Tech football game. And if you look real closely, they're wearing masks. They had a football game. And so they went through this in the early part of the century, or last century, and they got through. They got through. So I showed this to our faculty during the first day of pre-planning, just to kind of set the tone to understand what we're going to be you know, going through and what we're still going through. And we're still having school. We're still providing instruction. Students are still learning. We still got the vast majority, majority of our staff and uh, students come to school every single day. And so we're managing. Some of the bridges cost. If you can read there, I won't read all of that for you, but you can kind of look at that. You know, uh, we had an imperfect storm this year. What I mean by the imperfect storm, we had COVID, we had school renovation and we had full scale school change all at the same time. I would challenge any faculty to do what our faculty has done up to this point. They have been great, they've been professional, they've been collaborative, hard working, and they've done a tremendous job. We talk about our academies, and these are our four academies. We've got them uh, in different wings, and we got our four different academies set up. We're not as far along as we'd like to be. COVID had a lot to do with that. But we're well on our way. And we'll talk a little bit more about some of the things we're doing specifically for our academies as we move forward. Some of the richest costs. Now, back in 20, uh, March of 2020, remember when COVID hit, I remember we had a, a call board meeting on a Sunday to kind of decide what we're going to do the rest of the school year, at least in the near future. We ended up basically having to cancel school for the rest of the year. We didn't do it, the governor did it. And we had to pivot on a dime. A lot of times you hear about you can't turn an aircraft carrier on a dime. We did it in our Coffee County school system. We turned on a dime. And I don't think a lot of people understand how difficult that was the coordination that it took for us to pull it off. Also, our construction, we started, we didn't have a place to go during the pre planning. And the Central Square Complex gym and their staff was kind enough to allow us to do our pre planning, much of our pre planning in their facility. I don't know why that happens in that room that's in We go ahead and hit the desk. And there we are in the Central Square Gym. You know, uh, our maintenance staff did an excellent job on a very, very short notice helping us get set up. The uh, Central Square Complex has some breakout rooms. We're able to do some breakout sessions with our staff so they could pre-plan and we start to get ready for the school year. And they're very, very gracious. One of the great things about Coffee County and Douglas is how people can come together when there's a need. And I was very, very proud of how we were able to pull that off. Now where we are now, to the present, uh, teachers are teaching new content. Some teachers had to change their classroom from one uh, side of the uh, building to the other. And if anybody knows things, anything about high school teachers, that can be very, very dramatic and traumatic for teachers to move out of a classroom, some that have been teaching it for years. But this is what was needed. 
to meet the needs of our school. A lot of new processes we're working through. Uh, we restructured our leadership, social distancing, created measures uh, like Dr. Leach talked about to spread some of our classes out. We used the PAC, the Performing Arts Center. At times we used the cafeteria. At times we used the media center. So we're doing whatever we have to do to keep our students in class and, uh, and not having to send them home in quarantine whenever possible. Some of the lessons we learned, we got a great team. Our uh, teachers still go to, and it's ongoing, need support on the virtual learning process, but that's a major paradigm shift for teachers too. Some of the teachers have not had to use <laughs> online platforms to the extent that we're doing now. But what COVID has did, one of the positive things, it pushed us where we needed to go a lot quicker than we wanted to go, and say so we got some lessons learned, so we don't necessarily have to go back to where we were before. Now, we're talking about uh, academic instruction and some of our uh, academic support and professional learning now. You know, some of the things we do are not changed. These are non-negotiable. Standard-based instruction, the structural frameworks, engaging lessons, a thing of collaboration and common assessments we're constantly working toward. Those are non-negotiables. That's what not going to change whether it's COVID or not COVID. Those are, those are non-negotiables. You know, what we do to support our students, you know, we always still want to have our tutoring hours, monitoring their progress, uh, E-20 software, software, credit repair, credit recovery. This hasn't changed in our part partnership with Wild Rest in South Georgia and College 411 to help uh, high school students play in their academic career throughout high school and beyond. But these are some of the things that are ongoing and still in place. COVID has not impacted that. You know, professional development, uh, ingenuity, again, helping our teachers get up to speed on electronic platforms, virtual learning. We have new technologies with our innovations. Every, every school, excuse me, every room has a new projector. The teachers have to be trained on it, uh, training our new teachers, new teacher training, PBIS is still in effect, and uh, we're starting to have academy team meetings to develop that cohesiveness and collaboration within our uh, individual academies. You know, for the spring, next, uh, next year starting January, more project-based learning, and our, we're forming now our advisory boards for our individual academies. Uh, these are the community members that will ask to take part and become advisors to our different academies. Uh, in our fall, we uh, moved to academy locations. Like I said, some teachers had to move all the way across the building. Uh, we're going to hold at least two academy team meetings, focus on three I's, identity, interventions, and instruction. Uh, again, solidify our academy boards and hold a signing for all our academy community, community partners and deliver a P, uh, project based learning digital overview uh, and resource bank. Now, for the spring, advisory boards holding uh, meetings, continue with project based learning, uh, also, even a uh, teacher create a project-based learning, a minimum of one collaboration throughout the academy per semester starting out, and implement phase three of the ambassador program for our students. And when we have visitors, they would come in and be the ambassadors for their individual academies. And this is some of the advanced placement from last year, IEP. One of the things when we talked about the academy in the early stages, that AP is not going anywhere. Honors is not going anywhere. Transitioning to academy concept has not impacted that. So our students uh, who still desire to be take AP classes, none of that has changed. And you can kind of see some of the data from last school year. Yes, sir. Dr. Combs, I just want to commend you all for, for continuing with the, the AP program and what you're doing for our young people. That, that's a tremendous opportunity for all of our young people to, to be able to compete in some of the most rigorous classes in the state and in the country. Yes, sir. Thank you. You know, we obviously we got a strong commitment to that. Our, our students, and I'll just throw it in, they, they, our top students go to some of the best universities in the country. You know, they talk about Georgia Tech, but we also have students going to Duke, Wake Forest, Brown University, up in the Ivy League. They go, you know, wherever that talent will take them. So when our students go to these major academic universities, they are prepared. They also go to Valdosta. They also go to South Georgia. They also go to Georgia Southern. So it's not just those schools, but our students, we want them to be prepared for the next seven and uh, academic career. And these are some of our uh, awards from our uh, AP program, our AP Scholars, Scholars with Honors, Scholars with Distinction, and the National AP Scholars. So that was, that was not a typical year, obviously, because a lot of the, the 
uh, testing had to be done online. It wasn't in a typical environment like we would normally have, and I'm sure with everything that everybody in America was going through at the time, it, it probably negatively impacted this, you know, just like everything else. So this is not a typical year. This is good, but we, I know we can do better. Uh, Wide grass in South Georgia, dual enrollment. You can see that now. That's a strong, strong, uh, robust dual enrollment with uh, wire grass and with South Georgia College. A lot of communities, a lot of school systems are jealous of what we have in Coffee County when it comes to our relationship with South Georgia and with wire grass, how easily we can transition students back and forth during the day. Our work bears learning. You can look at some of our numbers from the uh, 1920, the 19 and the 2020 school year and for this year. So we have a strong presence with our work-based learning and students can go out and work, start understanding what the work, uh, work life is like, and any time a student can go out and work and own their own, earn their own money uh, and still get that high school credit, I think it's a valuable thing. You can see that some of the money that the students made uh, could be put back in the community. Class of 2020, I, I just want to always, you know, compliment the parents in the class of 2020 for what they had to go through. There's no other senior class that had to deal with what they deal, dealt with. Them having a traditional graduation was in jeopardy, but through a lot of hard work and guidance of the board and the central office and a lot of the staff at Coffee High School as well as the student and parents, we were able to pull that off and provide them with a very, very basically traditional graduation. They did a great job. We altered some things. But they got a chance to walk across the stage just like everybody else that went before them. And we're very, very proud of that. And you look at our four-year graduation cohort, you, know, you can see that we're holding steady. We're approaching 90%. Uh, we have came from uh, almost 70%. I think that's 81 up to almost 90%. And this is a testament to the hard work of the students, the teachers, and the parents, and the people in the central office by all of us working together to graduate almost 90% of our students from Coffee High School at this point. And these are some of the student awards that have been won. You can see it's in a variety of areas. FBLA, uh, 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 let's see what else we got out there. FFA, our CTA program is strong and robust and you're gonna hear more about that. We're very, very proud of the accomplishments of those students and when they go off the competition, we just had a, a award winner here lately, I think took top place, in the, and I'm sure they'll touch on that a little bit later. But the students in our CTA program do a tremendous job. They're well represented in all the competitions that we have every single year. They're talking about what's going on in Coffee County. Now this kind of wraps it up. Now we've had a very difficult year so far, and we don't know what tomorrow holds, but I do know we have a very difficult job doing what we do. It is difficult. Dealing with COVID, dealing with building renovation, dealing with transition to uh, uh, career themed academies, it is difficult, it's hard work. And sometimes it's messy work. And sometimes it doesn't run in a straight line, it's like the stock market, it's up and down. But it's difficult, but it's not impossible. And our job is to continue to work every day, being you know, fiscally responsible, working with our young people and teachers, and uh, to do the best we can. Our job is difficult, but it's not impossible. So I want to thank everybody for this opportunity, especially the board and Dr. Lee and everyone at the central office for working with us and providing us with the resources and the guidance we need to do the best we can for the young people of Coffee County. I'll be happy to have, ask any questions if anybody has any. Um, yeah, Dr. Dr. Cummins, going back to the, the academy concepts, yes, sir. The, the advisory board portion of that, um, when, when will that notification go out to the community? It will be going out very, very soon. We just had a uh, meeting, a presentation with the EDA yesterday and put out an appeal for those folks that would be interested. Ms. Baker, who's our academy coach, has done a tremendous job in building this program, helping to build this program from the ground up, and she's in communication with those community members now. And she's recruiting individuals to be a part of those advisory committees. Okay, so we're, we're recruiting this isn't just a notification that people can apply to to be a part of these, or how is it? How do y'all see that working? Well, she's actually calling on individual uh, community members and people in business to solicit their support and see engage their interest when they like to serve on these committees. Okay. 
Thank you, Mr. Charles. Thank you, Board. Thank you, Dr. Lees. Thank you, Dr. Cummins. And I want you to take back to your staff. We appreciate your leadership. And uh, to have a principal who's done the things that, that you have done at Coffee High School over the past eight years, it's been incredible to lead the school to a whole school reform, which is the academies. And to do that and to, to work through COVID and to work through uh, the challenges of, of the renovations. Just uh, make sure you go back and tell your staff. We appreciate them and we appreciate you. Thank y'all for your Thank you, Dr. Lee. Mr. Chair. Yes, sir. Um, if it pleases the rest of the board, um, I know we kind of talked about this a little off the cuff, but uh, with everything that we know that our high school folks, the maintenance department, everybody else went through, um, I'd like maybe at some point the board consider uh, sponsoring something special for the folks out there that we that we as board members also participate in. Um, I know that was a very hectic last few days. Um, and uh, with everything else on top of it, that didn't make it any easier. I know I know we're very, very grateful as a community that, that all the hard work that, that got done that nobody saw, you know, that the mm -hmm. folks that did it know how hard it, hard it was to get done. Um, but uh, just like us to consider that as a, as a group. Thank you. Thank you. All right, the next item on the agenda is the Charter System Annual Training. As you all know, we are a Georgia charter system. There are approximately 43 charter systems in the state of Georgia. And what charter system means is we have instituted distributive leadership in our school system where we distribute leadership to the schoolhouse level and decision making to the schoolhouse level. So under a charter system, we give the principal and his school governing council or her school governing council the autonomy to hire staff, to make recommendations for improvements in their building, to make recommendations for how they're going to operate their building. And the principal works in conjunction with that school governing council to manage the school. And so we have 12 schools, we have 12 school governing councils, and we have 12 principals who work with those school governing councils. And so the idea of distributed leadership, moving the decisions down to the lowest level has been very beneficial for our county and has been very beneficial for our school system. And most importantly, our boys and girls. We've had the highest graduation rates that we've, we've ever experienced as a community and as a county. And uh, we, we thank all of our schools for the hard work that they've done as far as charter school system goes and y'all know two years ago we were identified as the georgia charter school system of the year a part of that is training that we have to do we have to go through annual training and that annual training will be november 17th at 5 p.m until 7 p.m and it will be done virtually this year board members so you'll be able to get two hours of training credit through this virtual training that we'll do november 17th from five to seven. So that's the charter system annual training. Okay, on this training, um, if you, when you notice that things are not going good in the training, is, is there a time of, of place that you might step in when you're saying that uh, everything is handled at the lower level? Um, is there a time that you step in uh, uh, everything, you just sit back and just let everything be handled at that lower level? Well, that gets into chain of command and such as that and governance and that'll be discussed at this training on the 17th. Um, have all the, um, have all the student government, governing councils or the school governing councils, have all those already been seated for this year? Are there any openings? I'm pretty sure answers? they've been seated. Ms. Miller, do you know, I know Allison, Ms. Spade is handling that. She's our, our uh, person who's managing that at the district level. I'm almost positive that they've all been seated at this point, but under the circumstances that we've been in this year, there may be some vacant spots, but I don't think there are. You, but we can find out I mean, and, and follow up with Would that. you mind describing for the for the board again how the governing councils are, are chosen, how that works, the, the how, it's, how the memberships are made up? I don't have the bylaws in front of me, but we do have bylaws, and um, I'm going to try to think back to my principal days. 
So um, there are, the, the school governance board is made up of um, parents, community members, teachers, both certified and classified staff, not just all um, classified. The support staff could be an office personnel, it could be an assistant principal, it could be whomever. Um, those nominations are made and then there's an election. Um, and that, that notice goes out at the school level? I'm sorry. That notice goes out at the school level? It, it is and then parents, parents actually are nominated from the parent. So, so for instance, if, if it's a support personnel, those support personnel recommend that person. Parents are, are nominated, if you will, from other parents. Teachers are nominated from teachers. And so they serve um, alternating years like <clears throat> when we first begun, one served three years, two of them served like the, the parents. One served three years, one, the other two served two years. There's a total of 10 members, if I remember correctly, um, but there's, there's, there's terms. And so the community members, um, one of those community members lives in your school district and one doesn't have to live in your school district. So um, there are specific guidelines and bylaws that, that are followed in those processes. How many? Could, could you, I'm sorry. Oh, could, could, you share, could you share as your experience with the, as a principal um, the value of the school governing councils to you um, as, as a former principal? I mean, it's just, a, it, you know, we used to have um, school councils and then we became a charter system and we it transitioned into school governance councils and so we um, we utilize those school governance councils pretty much similar to what you all do for the school system um, they we presented things to them they gave us feedback um, whenever there was any employee or opening it wasn't that <coughs> we we would give scenarios like um, applicant A is, you know, applicant B or whatever, and they would give their input. So um, we shared data with them. Um, anytime we had a, a, any kind of information, we shared it with our school government council and got their feedback. Um, whenever we had any kind of, just any particular thing, any kind of school business, I shared that kind of thing with my school governance council and got feedback from them. Um, they were very vocal as far as offering um, suggestions for improvements for the building, um, the gym, for instance. You know that was it was old. It needed we needed a new that was green. So they were very instrumental in voicing and speaking up to help us get that the project. Um, but the school governance council was a, a I think it was a good um, proponent for. Um, West Green, our parents, was a good representation of our student body. And um, they were very, they participated, our community members, we had, um, we tried to have somebody that was from a large portion of our community, for instance, around the Sand Ridge, um, because that was a voice for them. So, <clears throat> it was it was just, I mean, it, it's been a good thing, I think, for our school system. Thank you. Okay, on those, um, right. Is, do you have any African Americans on on them? Is, is this just volunteer um, no, uh, appointed? Is well, I mean, it is volunteer. As it, as, you know, I'm not going to nominate somebody if I know they're not interested. Mm -hmm. So um, obviously, you have to have some kind of commitment to be on it because there are meetings. You know, there's um, there's a number of meetings that we have to have during the year to be in compliance with our charter system rules and regulations. Um, but for instance at West Green, I have a large Hispanic population, so I had a Hispanic parent on, on but she committed to that before we ever put her on the ballot. Um, had she not been elected, but but we didn't put anybody on the ballot that we didn't have them. they were nominated and then we approached them for their commitment before we took their name. But to answer your question as far as diversity on all the, I'm not sure. I can't answer that. I would assume but so. But you're saying it wasn't none on your board, right? I didn't have, I did, I had, um, I did not have one on my board, but I had Hispanic um, representation because I had a large Hispanic um, 
student body at this spring. So. Mm -hmm. Good. All right. uh, the next item on the agenda is the uh, minutes from the previous meeting. You've, you've had those minutes. Uh, are there any questions, changes, anything we need to do those minutes? All right. If it meets the approval of the board, we'll place those on the consent agenda for the regular meeting. Mr. Lott, you still with us? See there? Yeah, I think so. I, I can hear y'all kind of breaking in and out, but I can hear you. All right, great, great. I just thought about it. I was going to make sure. All right. Uh, financial reports. We have the financial reports for the month ending September 30, 2020. And we want to present these financial reports to the board. Uh, to be added to the uh, consent agenda at the regular meeting. Ms. Young, do you want to walk us through those reports? Yes, sir. The first report is a snapshot of our financials as of September 30th, 2020. And you can see that we have a beginning fund balance for the fiscal year of $19,349,718.10. And we have ended the um, month with $17,329,801.89. Any questions about that? Next. Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Comparison report. You'll notice on the comparison we have a, the fund balance that was just cited of seventeen million three hundred twenty-nine thousand eight hundred one dollars and eighty-nine cents, as compared to the previous months. Any anything there, Miss Young? No, sir, you can just say it's compared to the past three years and where we are at this point. Last year, you know, we were at the same point at 13 million, about around 13 million. is the monthly financial report. Yeah, this is the detail that shows all our revenues breaking down by area. And you can see on the second page that um, as of September, the revenues are at seven million and forty one thousand three hundred twelve dollars and ninety six cents. And then the next is the detail of all the expenditures breaking down by all the functional areas. And September 30, total expenditures was nine million sixty-one thousand two hundred twenty-nine dollars and seventeen cents. And you can see on the last page there where we end the month, the fund balance of seventeen million three hundred twenty-nine thousand eight hundred one dollars and eighty-nine cents. questions. I do. Um, Ms. Yon, on the um, TABT mm -hmm. uh, calculation, that's for the three months or is that? That is um, one month there. There was a posting error mm -hmm. and we corrected that on our financials. So it should have been two months, but that is one month. Okay. Is that the month of? That would be month September. Okay, so we don't have July and August or? July and August was calculated on FY20. Okay. It was approved. Okay. Thank you. Okay. All right. And 
East Blast. I do want to clarify with the East Blast, there was uh, a, a accounting uh, issue that was discovered at the state level that affected all school systems in the state of Georgia. So this is not just a Coffee County issue, but it goes back to 2015 and it's wound up being good for us right now uh, because they discovered that in their algorithms that they were using to to assign the, the uh, tax collections for each school district in the state that they had a mistake. And so they have corrected the mistake and it resulted in us getting approximately 500,000 additional uh, dollars this month in East Blast uh, from the State Department of Revenue. So uh, we, you will see on our SPLOS report this month a million dollars in SPLOS earnings. So we didn't have that big a, a month at Walmart this, this uh, month, but we did see uh, increased collections. And, and they also said that we did see some slight increase going back to May, March, April, May, June, July, uh, and we noticed an uptick and maybe it wasn't because of COVID like we thought that people had their stimulus checks out spending more uh, it was because of this correction to the to the algorithm so that now they we are getting what we're supposed to so that's a great looking spot report but it only be this one month <laughs> is there is there a breakout of what was actually collected locally versus what they, it, they, no, it was dropped all in a lump sum, and we called to verify, and that's what they told us. But they, they didn't have a break. They didn't. I, I mean, I, I mean, I can't imagine it's going to be tracked too differently, but yeah. I was just curious. Okay. Anything else? The next item on our agenda. <laughs> is the Broxton uh, Mary Hayes School Zone radar system. And approximately a month ago, Dr. Banks, who is our Assistant Superintendent of Operations and Maintenance and Facilities and uh, handles a lot of different issues for us in the school system. Dr. Banks couldn't be here tonight, but uh, his son, he'll be here a little later. His son has played in his JV football game out at Chardine Stadium, so he, he's out there watching his son. They, because of COVID, they haven't been able to play very many games, so uh, certainly wanted to be there to see his son play. But Dr. Banks, uh, uh, the assistant superintendent, was part of uh, a meeting that we had out at the city of Broxton. The mayor of Broxton summoned us out there, so myself and Dr. Banks and Chris Elrod, our uh, chief of police, went out to Broxton and met with the mayor. And the mayor of Broxton uh, and the police chief from Broxton uh, wanted to talk to us about this concept that we're going to present right now. So this was really brought to us by the mayor of Broxton and the police chief of Broxton and wanted us to consider this system. All right. So I wanted the gentleman from from Red Zone to be here and talk to y'all and, and tell you about the system. We're not going to ask you to vote on it tonight, but I wanted to present it to you and give you some time to consider it. All right. Okay. My name is Randall Rimes. I work for a company called Red Speed Georgia. Initially, Red Speed was started in uh, Lombard, Illinois, just outside of Chicago. We've been operating now a little over a year and a half in Georgia. Uh, back in 2017, House Bill 978, which is what's considered the school zone safety program, was passed <coughs> for us to be able to operate. And I say us. We work together with the school boards local law enforcement, whether it be city, county, whomever, to operate speed cameras within inside of the school zone. Um, everybody uh, knows, or, or most everybody does, that when you speed through a school zone that you can get pulled over for one mile an hour over. State law says that. This program, when it was passed, says that it must be 10 mile an hour or more before uh, the local government can issue a citation. Okay, kind of getting an understanding of how it operates. Um, so where Red Speed comes in, Red Speed actually comes in and puts the bill to put up the speed cameras, operate the speed cameras, uh, print out citations. Uh, understanding this, that when citations are written or sent out, they're sent out by the local law enforcement. It's not just Red Speed doing that. Uh, citations are sent out by the local law enforcement. We just actually do the mailing for them to keep the cost down on their end. Um, 
Where you guys come in effect is we have to get permission from the school board and a designee from the school board to sign off on the permit application. The permit application goes through GDOT and the state and everything gets reviewed before it is even approved. Uh, the big thing with the permit application, and this is the reason why I'm here tonight, is a big bold letters, and I'm the type of person, I don't, I don't hide anything. Uh, I'm a local person. I, I don't want to be looked at and say, that man lied to me when I come through Douglas at Walmart, and you see me. So, uh, uh, permit holder or local government are is responsible for the operations and maintenance of the automated traffic enforcement devices, which is our devices, which we will operate. There's no funding there for anybody to have to put forward to operate, including the operation and maintenance of school zone flashers. Um, each of us knows when we enter a school zone, there's, there's either flashers, and throughout the state, there are just some signs that says school zone between these times. Your school zones have flashers which operate that come on at a certain time in the morning and go off and do the same thing in the afternoon. State law says that we can operate these speed cameras an hour before school to an hour after school. So that covers any time that the kids are there. But these flashers that, that we're talking about, state says that when this application is signed, our equipment is put in, then the school board would be responsible, the county would be responsible for maintaining those flashing lights. What Red Speed has said, what Red Speed, and, and I talked about the lease about this uh, when we met last month, um, is that Red Speed, as long as we're in the picture, we're going to cover any cost with the existing school zone flashers. It tears up. I have a company that is contracted with us, Moy Electric, out of Dublin, Georgia. It will not take them long to get here. We fix any problems, any issues with the lights that get run over by a vehicle. We're back up here. We put them up ourselves at no cost to the county. Uh, with that being said, that is the reason why we have to bring it to you guys. Now to kind of tell you a little bit more about the program, I wanted to kind of get to the meat of the, the subject, the reason why we're here. Uh, with this program, like I said, we're a turnkey operation. That we, we don't charge the city for coming in and doing it. We don't say, hey, it's going to cost you fifty, sixty thousand dollars in five or six years. It doesn't cost them a dime. We come in and operate the system ourselves. Uh, as we're operating the system, the law says that there's a seventy-five dollar fine for the first offense, and a hundred twenty-five dollar fine for the second offense that an offender is caught. That is after the offender is caught and went to court for the first time, and then the second offense uh, imposes the hundred twenty-five dollar fine. Uh, the way that we're able to operate is the city or county, whichever local law enforcement uh, approves for us to be there, gets 65% of the fines. Red Speed recoups 35% of that to be able to recoup some back off of the equipment, uh, the maintenance and everything. All of our stuff has to run off electricity. We have to have internet. Um, and even in some instances, we have to pay for right -of to even be there. That is all through Red Speed. We take care of that. Now, benefits of this system being in your school zone. We have completed a speech study, which I did hand out a packet with that information in it. And this speech study, this is the page I'm on. This speech, that speech study was conducted in a 12-hour um, period as, as people are coming in out of school. Now we break it down, we take out the hours that don't need to be there, and we only operate it an hour before to an hour after school. The total people that come through that speed, speed zone, that school zone that day was 264 people over, 10 mile an hour over the actual speed limit, whether it be the school zone speed limit or the existing regular speed limit that is there, 264 people. We operate throughout the state. We have right now 86 operational cameras throughout the state. Out the state. So that tells that what that tells me, or, or should tell you, is that that is 43 different school zones that we're operational in right now. Local school zones consist of Ben Hill County, Alamo. We're in Thomasville. We have 21 going up very soon in the city of Albany. And so we're, we're, we're out there locally. What, what, with this, just 
not it, it's not just only the speed cameras that are offered through this system. We offer the local law enforcement um, video surveillance and LBRS. LBRS is license plate readers that when people come through that school zone, it, it'll pop their license plate, it'll alert police of stolen vehicles, it alerts police of sex offenders. And now, you know, in, in our community we have several, I'm not going to give a number, but I live in Pearson, we have several sex offenders and they're all over the place all the time. But say you have one sex offender that is in that school zone and they're in there multiple times and they shouldn't be in there, it's going to pick up on it. It's, a, it's an investigative tool for them to at least question why are you in the school zone, why are you going in out of the school so much when you don't have to... And it does that with the tag reader. does that with the tag so reader. The, the, the equipment's going to read the tag when they come through and if they're on that sex offender list, it's going to notify y'all that there's sex that is, that is correct. Because the school or something, you're going to know. That is correct. Is that only if they're tagging in that name, right? Yes. The sex offender have to have that tag in their name. And, and there's ways for us to be able to take in the local law enforcement. Say they have a sex offender that is registered and this vehicle is registered with them, but it's not their name. There's a way to cross reference that to be able to ping them if they're going in out of there more than what they should. If they're going in there, you know, if they don't have a business, one time is more than what they should. Um, video surveillance. Um, we've had places that just have praised the video surveillance because it is a just a breathless area for people coming in and out. Um, I noticed the other day when I was down in or over in Broxton, I noticed kids walking with their parents to school. I noticed the buses coming in and out. Just kind of sit there and watch the traffic, which is what I do. I'm, I'm still law enforcement. I still work in Atkinson County as a deputy sheriff. Uh, so with that being said, it's just kind of what I do. I, I like to watch traffic to see what the, the, the vehicles and people are doing. Uh, and as, as I was watching, I noticed the buses in and out. I noticed cars coming by. I noticed people not slowing down for these vehicles. Uh, so our, our system will see that. If, if you happen to have a wreck or an incident in front of the school, we can take and play those videos back and be able to see what happened exactly in front of the school. The school bus, kid gets hit, um, anything. Um, where that we've had people really look at the systems is that they've had armed robberies in town. And as vehicles are going out of town by the schools, we can actually pull that vehicle up and get an identification on the tag of that vehicle for them. There's many things that are positive about this system. I know one, you know, people say it all the time, well, this is just, just a money-making scheme. Well, no, it's not. It's something that the governor held close to his heart and said, yeah, we need something in the school zones to slow people down. Um, the way that it operates is that it reads the tag. It then sends the information to us we contact Inlets, which is a government agency for us to be able to get our tag information, and driver license information, all of that, and put it into the system. Once we do that, we take the video clip, we take the tag, and a picture of the vehicle. Every bit of that gets sent to the local police department. An officer has to sit in front of their computer, they have to watch, watch the screen itself, view the information, and then they click approve or deny. Red Speed does not issue the citation. The officer issues the citation. We are responsible for working the equipment. We are responsible for printing the notices when they come through. And we are responsible for mailing the notices. The actual citation comes from an officer, not from Red Speed. Um, you know, some people say, well, how can they do that? Well, Red Speed's not writing a ticket. It's signed by a local officer. Uh, Trying to think, I'm trying to make sure I cover everything. Who gets paid? Who gets paid? Yeah. There's so the a ticket that you know if you get a violation. There's a couple of different ways. Yeah. Um, we can set it up and we pay straight to the city, mm -hmm. or we set it up, pay to us, and we pay the city. You know, one big lump sum, once a month. That's totally up to the department. So it's a percentage y'all get. We get 35 percent of every citation, or 20, yeah, 35 percent of every citation. So that is our cut on the citations. Um, but like I said, the reason why we brought it to you guys tonight is because you have to understand about the, the school zone flashers. And red speed, and I'll give Dr. Lee some, there, there may be a letter if you do. You have a letter right there in front of you that says red speed will be, will be responsible as long as we're there. And the, the contract with the city is five years. 
Now the city can continue that contract after five years, and that is all and great. We'll be there for them. Uh, but after that, you know, it's totally up to the city. Uh, but we will be there for the whole five years, and we'll take care of everything. And the city will get the revenue. City will get the revenue. revenue. So we don't we don't get any of the revenue from this. But our benefit is slowing traffic down in front of the schools and keeping kids safe. So and, and that is correct. Um, now the revenue. Let's talk about that for just a second. The revenue just cannot be spent for the city budget. The state law has has said this revenue has got to be spent for equipment for law enforcement. It can be spent for special programs for kids at school. Uh, I know that the chief and uh, Chief Elrod and uh, Jason talked about some things that, that possibly spent some money on down the road. Uh, that can happen. Uh, it cannot be just for the general fund. The city can't say, hey, I'm just going to go spend this money. State law says no. It can, it can go to help put school resource officers in the school. Uh, it can go to help put crossing guards at the school. Whatever safety programs that there is, it can go help for that. And, and I know, uh, Jason, I've worked with uh, Chief Troop for a long time. I've worked with uh, uh, Chief Elrod for a, a little while. Uh, special first time meeting him, he tased me. <laughs> <laughs> but I've worked with him for a long time. And, and I know that they, they can work together to do things for the local school system there uh, when things are needed. One thing I do want to make sure, if the board were to agree to do this we would have to sign a document that would uh, we would basically give up the Department of Transportation's current school flasher in the school zone that they are managing and Georgia Department of Transportation is responsible for once that light is removed the Georgia DOT will not come back and put another one up. So if that is something we would be giving up if we were to do this. But now the city of Broxton, the mayor, has said they're committed to, to your program and yeah. having the, the radar there and having the, there'll be a sign to slow people down. And that is correct. Uh, something I did forget. There is a there is signage that says it's 500 feet from the existing flasher so outside of the school zone 500 feet in each direction it says that you're entering a, a speed detection zone so it's bright yellow white black sign it's very reflective that you see when you're in that zone but the city of broxton is they're committed they're, they're wanting to move forward with this um, they they've agreed with this for us taking over those those existing flashers and we will. We'll work the existing flash. If something happens, we'll fix it. Um, we'll stand behind our word. Like I say, I, I'm local. And I don't want you looking at me next time you see me saying that guy lied to me. So we're going to make sure it happens. Uh, any questions? Can you, can you hear me? Yes. Well, uh, oh, that, that was my question. That I had not at least touched on it, but I want to ask the question now. If, if DO2 takes their flashers down, and after five years or, or whatever point this contract runs out of Boston city decides not to continue with you guys you're saying that DOT is not going to come back and put a flasher back up the, the flashers will never go anywhere they'll always be there basically is that after the five years that if they don't if city of Boston does not choose to continue to stay with us then it will fall back on the school to continue the upkeep of the flashers this is not taking anything away from the school zone. This is just the upkeep of the existing flashers. But DOT's responsibility when they leave, they're not they're they're not coming back. No, they're not. The only okay. way that they'll come back is if DOT pulls the permit. Yeah. Okay. All right. Uh, and we're not voting on this tonight, correct? No, sir. Okay. I, I, and I, I don't I don't mean that like I've got problems with. It. I actually like a lot of what you're saying. I like a lot of things. You're, you're, I just want to make sure that. You know, if we do this, we thought about all the issues that could arise with it. Um, I'd like to talk to a few people about it and all, and, and get some more, maybe some answers on a couple of things. But like, so overall, I like I like what you're saying. I've just got some questions I want to kind of look into before we vote on anything. And if there's any anybody, any references you guys need to talk to, I'll I'll leave my card. 
you can email me, call me, and I'll get you all the references you need. You can call me and I'll get you all the references you need. You can talk to the local governments there. Okay. I have them all throughout the state. So. Uh, we have uh, we have a gentleman in the back that needs to talk to you. Wants to talk to you. If you don't mind, if y'all step outside, he'll answer your questions then. I just want to ask a general question to you because we have city and county police. Why can't the county police maintain that in Brockton because they have jurisdiction to do that? Instead of bringing you back. Take that outside. That's not part of our meeting. So, we'll go outside with him and address his concern. That'll be fine. Yeah, yeah. We appreciate you coming and presenting. Board, appreciate you. Please appreciate y'all letting us come and, and speak. Uh, I'll leave these cards. I'll just okay. leave them out right here. I'll just leave them right here. Thank you. Thank you. All right, the next item on the agenda is the CTAE purchase. We have uh, Ms. Rhonda Dorsey's here as the CTA director, and you can introduce your, your guest and tell us about what you have here for the board to consider tonight. All right, this is Spencer Highsmith. He is actually our young farmer advisor now. Uh, he was a former teacher at Nyland School and then former teacher at Nyland School, so he's now our uh, young farmer advisor. Um, what I have here tonight that we're wanting to uh, purchase is what is called a plasma table. It's where um, some of you have probably seen the metal designs cut. This is what this machine will do and uh, some additional things. But with that being said, we would like to use our local funds that are provided to us that matches one dollar more our um, Perkins funds that we receive from our federal grants. And with this, this will allow us to use this money to purchase equipment that in our AgMet class, along with, we hope, to build from using it there, possibly tying in maybe our graphics design classes, um, even possibly our engineering classes, um, and even some of our geometry classes. When Dr. Cummins mentioned our project-based learning activities, this would be a way that we can uh, intertwine some of their ideas, activities, some math, some possibly even a little science, depending on where we go with this. Um, it's very strong in vectors, which is some high level math there. But these are some areas that our top end kids, we hope to, to bring in with these activities, along with some of our uh, little achieving kids that, that struggle to provide some hands on activities. And I feel there's easy ways to pull in some cross-curricular with this um, particular table here. And I hate to say this, but in a sense, the sky's the limit with some opportunities and things we can use this for, even in a fundraising idea where we can, because as some of you have heard our presentation about financial literacy um, that we're trying to embed within a lot of our classes, there's some opportunities that would be allowed with this where we can do some fundraising let the kids you know, maximize the metal to then earn money for the system, or not system, but for our CK program to turn around and purchase more um, uh, metals and materials and things to, to keep this kind of self-serving once we get it in there. Um, and I'll let Mr. Highsmith mention some things. He knows a lot more about this particular device than I do, but it is very neat. One of the things that I would like to touch on too is like Dr. Combs was saying earlier, the opportunity with project-based learning. Um, the whole goal of rolling out to the economy, uh, excuse me, academy model is preparing not only our college readiness students, but also preparing those students that are going to enter directly, and if it's all right, I'm going to take this mask off. <laughs> I can't. Um, but also preparing our general student body that's going to go into the work and also bringing in those students because a lot of people view agriculture as people drive the tractors anymore. Well, there's also this engineering aspect and that ag mechanics aspect ties directly into that. So you're now bringing in a wider diversity of students into this and making them realize that the opportunities within the agriculture field are endless. But also it allows us to touch base with these businesses, these industries within our county and getting our students prepared to whenever they graduate and they don't want to go into or they want to go directly into the workforce they have a leg up they've already had this exposure they've already had this training so they could potentially have the opportunity to earn more than just someone with a high school because they have these certifications and training 
there any questions? Yeah, the, the, if you notice, they're recommending the higher of the, the, it's not a bid, it's a proposal. They did a request for proposals or, and uh, so, but it is, it is not the highest, but it's the second highest. And there's some items that were not uh, going to be delivered with the two that are less money. And uh, I, I did know that there were probably questions about that. That's why I wanted Rhonda and Spencer here to answer any questions. Can y'all describe why you want to go with the vendor that you're you're selecting? Um, with the Redmond Company, it is actually a company out of Georgia. Um, when we communicated with them, they have been quick to respond. They're very open, and their particular equipment is in currently I think it's 16 school systems in Georgia. Uh, several are are neighboring counties um, that use their equipment. They are great as far as they're coming on site to train, which is a very big plus. The Horizon Technologies, which is the cheaper one, their uh, training is in Bend, Oregon. We would then have to pay to send someone, so you've got additional costs that would, that's not included in this particular quote. Um, I will say that Spencer and I, when we were kind of checking out the quotes, checking out the equipment that was um, in these different companies, um, their particular website is extremely vague. Um, you have multiple icons that you can click in and once you do there's nothing there. It's like here's the picture stating that we have plasma tables. There are no plasma tables to look at other than the initial picture. So it kind of gave us a little leery feeling there. Um, I did contact him via email and phone. He did finally respond. Their tech support, which is one thing that kind of scared me here as well, is an a separate vendor. It is not their particular company that you would be contacting for tech support. So we really have no idea as to how great that's going to be. We can vouch for this particular company with Redmond, with the schools that utilize it. Their tech support is quick. They're on the phone, their email, and they can remote in, I believe, yes, can remote in and right then work on what the problem is while you're there. Um, with the techno company, they were missing, this was honestly just a few of the things they were missing. They were missing a lot more with what we needed. Um, and the particular table was not one that we felt was of the better quality from what we could look at and, and find online when we were looking at some of these things. That's why we were, went with the Redmond company. They seem to have the better product as well as the better support piece. There's also um, lessons that they can actually use with the students, with curriculum built in to help them get it going and, and students be able to use it um, in an easier manner to start with. Um, so that's why we were, were looking at this particular company over the two cheaper ones. Any questions? This is, this is funded with your Perkins money? It's not the Perkins, it's the local funds that match, that we have to have, that y'all provide us a dollar more to match the Perkins so we can continue receiving the Perkins. But we're actually going to use our local funds for that, so that y'all provide us. Mr. Lott, any questions? No, no, I've, I've been looking at it. I'm, I may, I'm fine with it. Okay. This, will this be SPLOST or General Fund? This would be SPLOST. No, 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 this is their this is their local revenue, their CTA okay. that, that they're awarded for right. their allotment, and we always we allot them as much as the Perkins is, and the Perkins is approximately a hundred thousand this year, so they have a hundred thousand in their local funds that they will use to purchase this piece of equipment. If we use our Perkins fund, any revenue, any profit we make, we have to then turn around and report back to the federal. And, and give that back. So if we use it here, this allows us to take that money to turn around and buy additional metal to replace what we're using as we, we use it. All right. And we are asking for approval tonight so that they can go ahead and get the equipment in and get, you know, our young people can go ahead and start using it. Uh, I've been told that you can do some amazing yeah. things with one of these. There are some awesome projects. I've even seen several um, neighbor counties actually uh, device they're at, or um, thing they're presenting them to sell as a fundraiser their tag group made where they 
created the cuts and the design and they're crafting uh, welded the um, fire pit and they're actually using it from my understanding as a um, solid auction piece for a fundraiser in a neighboring county that I saw on their Facebook page uh, I think it's a couple weeks ago using this awesome. All right, thank, thank you. you. Thank, thank you. So we need to put this on the consent agenda. Yes, sir. It will be placed on the consent agenda. All right, the next item is the surplus property. Dr. Newell, you want to describe to us what this surplus property is? Yes, sir. Um, we've been replacing our older classroom data projectors over the last um, year, year and a half. And we've got um, probably about 150 to 160 of the older ones um, in storage right now. We need to hold on to a few of those to use for spares until we're able to replace the remainder. But we, we would like to declare 100 of those surplus um, that would free up some space in our warehouse. And we would like to post those on gutbills.com for all the year. Thank you, Mr. Newell, Dr. Newell. Uh, the next item on the agenda is policies. We have uh, a number of policies. We're just placing these on the agenda for a first read, not asking for approval of these tonight. There's been some changes in Title IX that require us to amend some of these policies. So this is uh, really just a housekeeping thing. The George School Board Association sends the samples and we've updated these policies based on those samples and we we'll put it to the board for y'all to study over the next 30 days and we'll come back to you next month. All right. So these will be posted on the website yes, for public input? That's right. Yes, sir. All right. And that's all we have on the agenda for the work session. At this point, we do have audience participation and uh, we have audience participation. We have uh, a Reverend Rudolph Porter. And I do have this statement on the audience participations. Uh, we've got the policy in front of the citizens of the community have the expressed right and are encouraged to attend meetings of the board to listen and observe the deliberation of its members. However, the following steps in the order below shall be taken to resolve any problems or issues. Individuals are expected to contact the superintendent or designee in an effort to secure a satisfactory solution to a concern prior to this referral. Uh, if not resolved, first step one, the person may ask to appear on the agenda. If the group is present, there is more than one. Spokesperson, a maximum of 10 minutes shall be allowed. Uh, when the board received, and I'm not reading all this because you've heard it before. I must have so, Yes, sir. When the board receives a request, special action, the board chairperson may seek a motion and conclude action during the board meeting, elected to further matter to the superintendent. Uh, the board will not hear all compliance regarding school personnel except the manner provided or else we're, we're in the policies and regulations. Uh, these regulations are not designed to restrict the scheduled appearance of citizens who have regular business with the board and with those presentations are provided for the agenda. Uh, recognition of individuals who are not citizens of the school community is determined by the chairperson. All persons seeking the opportunity to speak at a board meeting or to address the chairperson may direct questions or comments to the board members or other officers. You have five minutes. Excuse me just a minute. Have yep. you previously met with Mr. Lease, uh, Dr. Lease, about what you bring him before? No, I've been in five months and like talking to a wall. No one's contacted me on everything. Well, I would be glad to have you come in and sit down and let's talk. And uh, you mind to do that after this meeting? That's something for me. Okay. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Right, go ahead. I'm Reverend Rudolph Porter, the Chairperson of the Political Action Committee for the Coffee County NAACP to Dr. Lease and to the Coffee County Board of Education. Not much has happened or changed within this board or its meeting over the past several months. 
am before you yet again due to this board's unwillingness to work with the community and its leaders who have come before you and voiced valid, relevant concerns. Repeatedly, this board has sat and watched month after month as speaker after speaker come before you with no response. Five months, I presented five position papers based on nothing but facts from documentation obtained through public records. I've seen parents come in here and say their students have been abused. I've had pastors come in here and plead for this board to reach out to the parents who feel like their students have been abused. And then while I'm sitting in here, there are community leaders and parents outside shouting, no justice, no speak, no peace. And it's primarily because this board won't communicate with the community. I count 12 seats in here, five or six seats in the lobby. People want to be heard when they have legitimate concerns. The Georgia Open Meetings Act provides the public with the right of access to meetings of a large number of government bodies at the state and local level in Georgia. According to this act, it entitles the public to notice of these meetings and gives the ability to inspect a copy of meetings minutes. Georgia Open Meetings Act, known as Georgia Sunshine Law, covers the meetings of the governing body of an agency and committees created by its members. Some examples of the governing bodies of agencies covered by the Open Meetings Act include the state boards of commission, such as the State Board of Medical Examiners and the Soil and Water Conservation Commission, county commission, regional development authorities, school boards, library boards, hospital authorities, planning commissions, zoning boards, boards of trustees of the public universities, and nonprofit corporations operating public hospitals. For additional details on government bodies covered by the Open Meetings Act, for months, this board has purposefully denied citizens of Coffey County the right to provide by the Georgia Open Meetings Act by not moving the meetings to facilities that will accommodate those wishing to exercise their right. It's shameful that 12 or 13 citizens can be here and only seven or eight in the lobby and we got a school system with thousands of kids. For months, this board has purposely denied the citizens of Coffey County the right to provide by the Georgia Open Meetings Act by not moving this meeting to a large facility. For months, the Coffee County NAACP has come here using me, a pastor, and a grandparent with two students in this system, bringing me here voicing concerns of racial disparity, disparities within the teaching and administrative staff in Coffee County system. Now, last month when I was here, I said there was only 55 black teachers out of 450. I made a mistake. I was wrong. There's only 55 black teachers out of 505 teachers. I made a mistake. No one corrected me on that. Out of 505 teachers in the Coffee County school system, there are only 55 black teachers. And we have a student body made up of 55% students of color. For months, the Coffee County NACP has presented data, facts that attest to the discrepancy between the number of employed certified black and Hispanic teachers and administrators and the numbers of black and Hispanic students. We are using your records. For months, this school board has had little to no comment and even less about resolution of these problems. We are living in a time when the message must be clear about the position taken in this community. Your position is clear that you care little or nothing about these issues brought before you. Whether it's a soft-spoken pastor, female pastors and preachers, or someone loud like me, you ignore all of us. Your position, 
You got my point. Thank you. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. We have uh, Mickey LeBrockington. Michaela Brockington. Yeah. Long distance. Makes no sense. We have no intention to listen to these people. We've been listening to them for how many months? Yeah, but I'm going to do something about it. Yeah, hit you guys with this. Beat the drum. We can just miss this meeting now. You can. That's on you. I can. Because you ain't doing nothing about what they're saying anyway. You know how let's continue with a meeting. In order. Thank you. Yeah. The next. You up. Good evening, everyone. I hope y'all doing good today. Um, we have been um, outside protesting, um, speaking up for our rights. Um, because we have continuously come to the same hope. We want the change to happen within our school system with actions. We do not want, we have a few demands. We do, we thank you, we appreciate you for creating a table for us to speak on. We thank you for listening to our criminal justice chair from NAACP. We, we, are, we apologize that it had to get that far. We apologize that we had to speak to the people from upstate and get a direct action for the things that has occurred in the school system. If you are confused, if you're looking at me like you don't understand what happened, maybe you need to check your racist uh, radar. Because at the end of the day, we have continuously came up here and asked you to change different things and mechanisms that have occurred in our system. The appropriation of the things of, of the students that are here, um, West Side, there's different disparities. I looked at the rates. I was trained to look at the different rates and the numbers of the statistics of who is being targeted as far as disciplinary actions. We all here know exactly how the prisons are set up. We know exactly that the school to prison pipeline, it starts with the school system. You're confused? Go look it up. The justice system and also the, um, also the juvenile justice system has created something on the national level that you might want to look at that the state of Georgia has not adopted. And that is the school to prison pipeline dismantle. It's a long list. It tells you exactly how you can end and um, change the way that the school to prison pipeline has occurred. If you go look into the board, Brown versus Board of Education to see exactly why we integrated. It was because we had awful um, books. We had different things. It's in our books that you give us when I was a student. So everybody else also know exactly what happened. So don't be confused on why we're outside asking you to give us justice and give us peace. Understand that all we want is justice for the kids that don't receive. Yes, we know people got money can do certain things in this county. Because guess what? I can I can pay for a meal if I have a dollar. But if I don't have a dollar, I have to go apply in a long line for an EBT card that I gotta wait for. And then I gotta wait to see if they're gonna give me enough money to make substance for my children. So let's stop the plan. If there's somebody, this can be an economy here in Coffee County. We can have somebody set up something for the people so that they can have a machine, right? A EBT machine, right? So now I just mentioned somebody who don't have anything. So you got Harvest with an EBT machine and I have an EBT card. I need that EBT card to help my family live. Harvey's need that money from the government in order to make them sustain. So if I go to Harvey's and swipe my card for $500, they just came up $500 from the government. That is the same way insurance works. If there's a doctor who get paid $100,000 a year, now we got somebody else on the other side that needs Medicare and Medicaid because they don't have the money. Well, guess what? They got insurance. They're able to actually have Medicaid and Medicare in their office. If they have Medicaid and Medicare in the office, now you can swipe your insurance card and get money from the government. This is the same way the school system works. The school system works off of Title I, two, three, four funding. So what happens is if you have special needs, if you are on um, low income subsidies, if you have issues where you need help, the school system can gain money. That's why y'all just got millions of dollars just for the COVID-19 crisis. 
You had to buy sanitizer and everything. But if there was no COVID-19, you would not have gotten any funding. If there is no black people, no low-income people, you would not get the title fundings that you need for the school system. So I'm begging y'all, I'm asking y'all, help, listen, Talk to us. It can work together. We don't have to be separate. We don't have to be on one side and the other side. We can actually work together and make it make a change. But we want y'all to do it with us, not against us, but listen to us because it is us who actually put our meat in these seats and these seats create beds for, for those prisons. Kedalia Martin Suggs from Gwinnett County, Georgia NAACP. Gwinnett County. No, I'm in Gwinnett County. You know the, uh, you know, let's say, recognition of individuals who are not citizens of the school community. You know, I can hear you. Uh, you live here? Or? No, I'm Georgia's NAACP criminal justice state chair. So I'm, for the, I'm over the entire state. Where I can travel throughout the state. And also, um, I've been appointed at the state know, mitigation investigator. Hold on just a minute. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, we're going to hear you tonight, but normally we wouldn't. If you're not a member of the community, we would. Have, have you met with Dr. Lisa? I want to meet with you tomorrow. I set up a meeting with um, Chief Great. and also um, with your director. Great. Um, but I do want to introduce myself first, okay, go if ahead. that's fine. Go ahead. My name is Hildaya Martin Suggs. I am Georgia's NAACP criminal justice chair for the entire state. Um, I was also appointed by Gwinnett County District Attorney Danny Porter as the first state mitigation investigator in the state for you facing SB 440, SB 441. Also, I am a member of the Department of Juvenile Justice Advisory Council where I help make decisions for the youth incarcerated on a regional level. And I'm a youth advocate on the state level as well. So I'm here to discuss a matter. So. If we could set up a meeting for tomorrow, I think you kind of know what the matter is about. That would be great. I just have no idea, but I'll, I'll be glad to meet with you tomorrow. That'd be great. Okay, it's for the youth, the three youth that's 11 years old, uh -huh. where they were wrongfully um, interrogated. Uh -huh. Okay. Well, we'll meet tomorrow. Okay, so what time tomorrow? Uh, Cause I drove all the way down here almost four hours. 11 a.m. I drove almost four hours to meet you and speak with you. Resolution. 11 a.m. 11, that's perfect. Cool. I'll be here. Uh, okay. Thank you. I just want to say this. Yes, and you can get it or whatever. I want to say this. I apologize uh, for the abuse that y'all are getting tonight. This is embarrassing. We have this is we embarrassing. We have an order of meeting this world. So I, we have to you get you might have your order, but you made up your mind before you got there. You've been holding that gavel in your hand ever since election. you got here. And that is embarrassing. This is what we get. That This is disparaging. You don't hold the gavel for nobody else but us. You call the police for uh, us. Every time we get here, the police is already...